I don't know about you, but after another late night watching the debate, I'm definitely a little groggier than usual today. And it's only going to get worse from here. Staying up for the primary results on Saturday, then Super Tuesday a few days later, plus all those late nights binge watching Better Call Saul after work. So that got me thinking, why do we need so much sleep anyway? That's a question at the heart of a new documentary from Nova that dives into why we spend close to a third of our lives asleep, why it matters, and what happens when we don't get enough of it. We find that the brain is just as active when we're asleep as when we're awake. The things that you learned yesterday are now transferred to a safer storage location. But second, when you wake up in the morning, you have a refreshed capacity for new file acquisition all over again. The film's producer, Terry Randall, joins me now, along with, nice to see you, Terry, by the way, yes. along with one of the scientists featured in the film, Rebecca Spencer, who's a UMass Amherst professor of psychological and brain sciences. Great to see you, Rebecca. Thanks right. for being here. And congratulations to both of you. I'm assuming Nova decided to do this because of how little we know about something we spend such a huge amount of time doing. Is that the motivation, I'm guessing? Yes, and also there's all this new research going on that's fascinating. So how, why do we need so much sleep there, Rebecca? Well, there's uh, so many things that our brain is busy doing while we're sleeping. So you go through four different stages of sleep, and I would argue that every one of those sleep stages is doing something different for our memories and our decision-making and all of our cognitive processing. Can we talk about memories for a second? One of the scenes I loved in this thing was with Rebecca Gomez. Is that not her, her name? She's detailing a sleep experiment where some kids, after taught something new, take a nap, some wait a while, and there's a different in re difference in recall. Here's a little bit of that. Where's the set? How much do they remember? What we found is that the children who nap soon after learning Mop. remember the words about 80% of the time. Uh, where's the set? In contrast, the kids who went through a long period of time before they napped Where's the set? only remembered the words about 30% of the time. Where's the taupe? So you see a huge difference between 80% of the time and 30% of the time, and that's the difference the nap makes. I had a zet when I was a kid, by the way. That's a huge differential. Why does that happen? Yeah, that's because while you're sleeping, your brain is putting that memory on replay. So just if you like, if you wanted to wor learn all the words to your favorite song, you'd put it on the iPod and listen to it over and over again. And that's essentially what the brain is doing uninterrupted. But it, but it matters. Obviously, it matters when the sleep occurs and how close to the new information intake has happened, correct? It may matter. Some of our studies actually show that the, the naps can recover memories from earlier in the morning. So there is some leeway there to be able to go back and rescue. The memories might have decayed a little bit between learning and lunchtime, and then the nap can actually recover some of those memories, which is a, a pretty cool feature of sleep. But, but I watched this late last night, so if I got this a little wrong, correct me. There's another circumstance where you're talking about where people in the film are talking about people who've experienced trauma and having some space between the trauma and when they go to sleep, that time lag does help. That Why does it? Right, that certainly can be the case. And, and those are memories also that uh, could be advantageous. We want those memories to decay and to oversleep you would be less likely to process them as they get weaker. How sleep deprived are we? As a society, we're very sleep deprived. I think that there's a lot of features of our, um, our kind of culture and behavior that contribute to that. So we are constantly anxious, we're constantly in front of screens, and those things are definitely not supportive of our sleep. Well, it's also attitudinal. I looked up a quote I remember from Donald Trump in the Daily News when he was Citizen Trump, and he said, how does somebody that's sleeping 12 and 14 hours a day compete with someone that's sleeping three or four? That is a fairly prevalent attitude in this incredibly competitive world, is it not? That's for sure. And you hear it even in our college students who argue that it's a great thing to pull an all-nighter before an exam. But I think now is, uh, there's been a shift of tides, though, to really show the, that sleep is benefiting learning, it's benefiting cognitive functions, and that maybe some of these people that argue that they're doing great on short sleep might 
not know how well they could do with a little bit more. But it is true that some people can function with less, is it not? Yeah, so sleep time is genetically determined, and so there's a gene for being short, so you could be very lucky and have that gene that allows you to get all of these functions of sleep in five hours. I learned a huge amount last night in 55 minutes. Did you, or did you go, you look at the look on your face, you did, so did you change any behavior in your life as a, as a result of what you learned making the film? Well, first I appreciate sleep in a way that I never did before. What does that mean? I know what, that my brain is busy doing really important things. And, you know, most of us think, well, we go to sleep, then we wake up. We have, we have very little recall. Unless well, most of us think our brain goes to sleep with right. us, as right. a matter of which we are right. disabused of in the film. So how have you changed just the appreciation of... I, what I hope the film will do is, is help people respect sleep. I think that's the first step in actually getting a better night's sleep. And then think about the timing of sleep. How much sleep do you need? You know, we talked about naps before in the context of little kids. Can we, we talked on the radio with Marjorie Egan today when you were on a little bit about naps for adults. So what's the optimum amount of sleep? Is it seven to eight hours? Is that what you're sort of half nodding? What is the optimum Yeah, amount? again, everybody's sleep need is different, and it's your genetics are contributing to that. We also know that your sleep need changes with age. Um, so to give an exact number is a little tricky to do. We like to throw around this number of seven to eight hours, and that's based on averages of what people were sleeping at some time, and it probably is the average of what, you know, generally adults need. Okay, let me take the low end of that, seven hours. I can only sleep five hours tonight but I can take a two hour nap tomorrow. My total interrupted by maybe a half a day's work mm -hmm. will be seven hours. Am I is similarly situated to somebody that slept seven hours straight? Yeah, so fragmented sleep like that will probably be less efficient. And so you would probably need more sleep time if you're having fragmented sleep. So maybe eight hours interrupted is equivalent to seven hours uninterrupted, something like that. Just because we perhaps waste a little efficiency going in and out of sleep in those lighter sleep stages that aren't really doing all the functions that I think you want sleep But naps for. do help. I mean, you're basically, naps can, even if they don't make up for what you lost, they Absolutely. do help. Absolutely. Naps can serve the same exact function. You know, one of the things you say in the film that sort of blew me away, everybody watching this says to themselves at one time or another, what do my dreams mean? What is the point of this dream for those of us lucky enough to remember our dreams? I don't for the most part. You tell a story about dreaming about your daughter almost drowning or something. Yeah. Tell the story and then tell us what you conclude from that kind of dream. So I remember having a dream when my daughter was very young of her falling into a pool and drowning. And uh, I would think nothing of that dream except for with having a, a newborn and fearing that situation. It convinced me to put my kids in swim lessons and they still continue to swim 10 years later for water safety. And it really speaks to what's called the threat simulation theory of dreaming. And that is this idea that we dream to practice for situations to keep them bad things from happening. I always was a skeptic of that idea. When I first learned of it, I thought, like, why am I dreaming of being chased by a tiger? That's not something that's likely to happen. But once you have a dream that's a more realistic scenario and really does cause you to change your waking behavior, then it makes you take a second guess that maybe there is some function of dreaming and allowing us to practice for those things. So when uh, virtually everybody, when they're asked about what's the dream that stays with you most, talks about an incredibly embarrassing moment, they're up in front of a room, they forget their speech, or they're naked in front of a class or some such thing. What is that doing for me? I've had a couple of those. Why am I dreaming that? Well, I would certainly think that the if you had those during your training early on, it would be a great way to convince you that you need to be more prepared. So I do think some of our students that have these nightmares of missing an exam, that might be a way that they are implicitly learning you need to be more prepared for exams. Uh, and I did need to be more prepared. Turn, <laughs> what's the state? I mean, there's so much new science, as you said before. Is it continuing to explode or have we reached sort of a critical mass time, would you say? No, I think it's just beginning. I think that uh, researchers are learning more and more about our, you talked about uh, dreams, our emotional processing, um, how we retain information. I think they're just really starting. What are some of the most promising areas where you think sleep can either be 
a cure or an amelioration of something negative? What are those areas that we're sort of on the cusp of? For well, I think one of the hot areas is trying to understand this idea of the brain cleaning process that occurs during sleep. And you'll see in the feature tonight that there's a, a, a cleaning process where the neurotoxic waste that's built up over the, in the brain that can contribute to disease. There's new data to say that sleep, there's a really important function of sleep in cleaning that out. And mm. how much could be done just by knowing that is really just we're, we're just beginning to and do we uh, beyond that the value you talked about is that also a value because it ne you need a clean sweep so there's room for new thoughts and yeah. ideas and th is that part of it so too? I would argue that these things we're going to eventually figure out how these two things go together does that process relate to this process of cleaning out memories and storing them more efficiently one thing they have in common is they're both related to slow wave sleep one specific stage of sleep mm. so it's quite possible that there's a relationship between these things and again that's an open area for scientists to figure out so this is on tonight you made it so you've seen it you haven't even seen the whole. Are you nervous no. about that? <laughs> I get to watch it for the first time with my lab and um, a bowl of popcorn. I was going to say don't go to sleep, it. but that's a horrible line. I've so heard I that one before. It. Nice to see. I figured <laughs> yes. that. that gets a pleasure. Terry, congratulations. Thank you so much. The film is great. You, should, you can catch Nova's Mysteries of Sleep tonight at 9 right here on GBH2 or stream it online at wgbh.org slash Nova.